example, to the sheep pole. Flag them down. Last time on Across the Mojave, I had to dig a hole at Chakawala Spring in a quest for water. Although I did eventually manage to pump some fluid out of the muddy hole, it turned out to be almost undrinkably brackish and bitter. Ugh. It's actually not that sulfury, but it's bitter and brackish. It's probably quite alkaline. I mean, it's probably better than no water, but, um... Ugh. Anyway, so I used the, uh, the brackish water for making my soup. Just an addendum on using the brackish water for the soup. It actually, uh, you know, I remember there was a reading a, a, a journal by one of the Death Valley 49ers about they found a spring that was too salty for good soup. But this water in the soup actually works okay. It's a little saltier than usual. There's maybe a little bit of a taste hiding in there among the spinach and kale, but um, it's definitely edible. Um, and I think I'll use the rest of it to make bread. I'll just leave out the salt. <laughs> And hopefully the alkalinity won't kill the yeast. Okay. Slept in a little bit this morning. Oh, there's the sun coming right now. Uh, slept up until, you know, just before dawn. Uh, the worst thing is waking up to. Oh, I've been waking up before dawn. Uh, it's kind of nice, actually, to wake up and have it already be light outside. Yeah, this is my typical camp. Normally you don't get to see my, my camp when I'm still like in bed because it's dark outside. I usually even get up at five, which is more than an hour before the sunrise. Uh, but I figured I actually don't have, relative to my previous days, if I'm walking across the alluvium, it's actually not going to be that bad. Which was actually sort of the point. The point is that, that way you can hopefully get there, you know, mid-afternoon, well, before my water runs out, rather than getting there, like, you know, at or after dark. Okay. Well, I'm finally off, so I'm a late start today, but I think it's okay. It's, I think, a little more than a dozen miles, but shouldn't be too bad. Okay. Now we're looking further west than we've seen before. I think those are actually the Coxcomb Mountains. The Eagle Mountains are the next ones over. Those will be in, in, in four days. Out in the desert, you often see little islands of rock out in the middle of alluvium like this. Uh, one that's right in front of us. Uh, these are called Inselbergs uh, from the German island mountain. Uh, and basically something like this would have originally been, you know, part of the ridge on the mountains. But as all these, all this alluvium, all this loose rock is washed out of the mountains, eventually it piles up and then drowns the valleys of the mountain uh, until only the tops of the little peaks of the ridges remain. Um, giving you these inselbergs. You guys have in deserts basically because there's not that much water. So uh, the all this rock tends to pile up close to the mountain, forming these big alluvial plains, rather than being carried a long distance away in a river somewhere. And ultimately, I'm going back up that canyon behind the inselberg. This trail lacks any hoof prints. So I wonder if this may represent the original human trail up to Corn Spring. If you think about how the landscape would have looked when people used to walk this trail regularly rather than the big road, you don't really wouldn't have looked any different. Mountains haven't really changed much. The only big difference is my knowledge that there's a road on the other side of the hill. and people coming to drop off a supply of food and clothes so I don't have to forage for it myself or hunt. Hooligans! Oh wait, those are my parents! Yeah, so there's petroglyphs here that apparently have been dated to around three or four thousand years old on the basis of comparison of the styles of the petroglyphs and the amount of desert varnish that has covered them over. So some of these are fake petroglyphs by uh, recent wannabes, but the ones that are real, you can see, have the desert varnish is starting to grow back onto them. 
So like those ones there, uh, you can see some of them, they're starting to turn brown again from New Desert Varnish. And so scientists who specialize in these things have estimated their age at about three or 4,000 years. And here's some more pretty good, here's some more pretty good petroglyphs and a sign, historical marker. Okay, well, here's camp. That's all you got though, is that? Yeah, this is all I have. Is there everything else I drank, including the water that I pumped out of the well? Thanks to cool weather and careful rationing, I had made it to Corn Spring with water to spare. The next obstacle was to finish crossing the Chuckawalla Mountains, the most rugged range I had come to yet. Need rescuing, you'll let us know. Okay, we'll do. Okay, okay. bye bye, parents. Okay, bye bye. Be very careful. So, just leaving Corn Spring Campground now as the sun is rising. And a nice sunset. Actually, a little better a couple minutes ago, but that's just the way sunsets, sunrises work. Um, so, the good news is that today I only have to hike four miles. The bad news is that I'm now carrying 16 liters of water and a full thing of food, so I'm probably, my bag is probably close to 70 pounds. And I'm gonna be walking on these kind of mountains today. I'm gonna be starting by going basically directly up that mountain face. So, we'll see how that goes. Some golden light on the rocks now. These rocks, by the way, are, are all basically granite, or maybe it's friend granite diorite. Um, I'm not sure these are well dated yet. I have some samples, but um, it's, it's probably about 80 million years old based on the way it looks. I mean, that is to say, there are similar granites that look like this that are about 80 million years old. <clears throat> yeah, it would have been formed uh, above a subduction zone where oceanic crust was being pushed underneath the North American continent back at the time of the dinosaurs. There's the sun again. As the way gets more, certain pivot steps can go up here. I don't know how long you get up that, but this thing's often resolved as you get a little closer. Here's where it starts to get a little on the northern side. Man, having a 70 pound pack sure makes it harder. The problem is all this rock is loose. So every step you have to be very careful. You don't have to go sliding down. These rocks here might be steeper, but they're going to have the advantage of the rock to be loose. It looks like a bedrock. Sometimes it's better to climb a solid rock than to walk across these ones. As you recall, coming across this stuff walking. Uh, no handholds. I need to get a better foothold. They don't need as much of a handhold. Now I'm up on this, well, calling it a plateau might be a little bit generous, but um, now I just need to go across the somewhat flatter surface, head over to that gap there, and then repeat this sort of up and down, growing across little hummocks and bumps. Yeah, so then incidentally looking on that way, so that's Corn Spring Wash again. I'm basically paralleling this, but in the mountains. You might as well, why don't I just walk in the wash? It would be easy. I could walk four miles in like two hours. Uh, and basically the problem is that whole valley is outside the wilderness area. So there's no, there's no way to, to walk up the valley while staying in the wilderness. And, uh, you know, there have been a couple of places where I've shortcut it out of the wilderness because I'm low on water or something like that. But I'm going to try not to do that if I don't have to. If any of you guys have ever been to Joshua Tree National Park, 
You'll see this looks very similar. And first of all, no, we're really not that far away from Joshua Tree National Park. But somewhat, we're going to come over one of these rises and be able to see it. And then geologically, it's very similar to both places. We have these rocks, which are uh, mostly granites or granite-like rocks, like granite diorite. And then in both cases, they tend to be rounded to these big, round, blobby shapes. Um, that's actually something that happened much more recently. Uh, that's something called spheroidal weathering. Uh, but basically, the granite, when it comes up from the ground, it gets all these cracks in them. See these cracks down here? Those are called joints. Um, no, you can't smoke them. Um, but basically, as the rock comes up from the ground, uh, the pressure on it decreases a lot. You know, down under the ground, there's a huge amount of pressure just from the weight of all the rock on top of it. But it comes up, that pressure is released, and the rock cracks. Um, it sort of expands outwards. Uh, as it has less pressure on it, uh, making all these nice cracks or joints is the fancy word for them. Uh, but then water seeps down in the cracks, and uh, the water preferentially then breaks up the minerals along the cracks. Um, and so it starts off by breaking into basically blocks, which are, you know, little cubes or rectangular prisms. Uh, like here's a sort of rectangular prism that's still pretty fresh. Then over time, the corners get wet because the corners have more area for the water to sort of seep into the cracks and break down the minerals. Uh, so the corners get rounded off, you end up with these big spheroidal, spheroidal lumps. Um, and my understanding is where you get this particularly spectacular spheroidal, spheroidal weathering with these really big um, uh, pieces of granite uh, is typically where that weathering actually happened underground. Um, so if you had like, if there was like a layer of soil over these mountains at some point, um, and that the groundwater then in the soil was causing that, that weathering in the cracks to round off the edges. Because these days it's pretty dry out here. Okay. Yeah, down to this. So I think now look at my map, but I think I have to drop down, go up that canyon there, and then I think my campsite is basically on top of that big mountain over there, which uh, doesn't look that far, but it also looks like a rugged granite scape moving here and there. So for all the hiking I've done and climbing, I've only come about a mile from camp out of four. So I'm a quarter of the way there. I just lost my footing there for a moment. Oh. More of a cascade. Wow. Of course, the rocks here are very slippery. It's the one problem with these kind of dry waterfalls is that they've been polished down by the running water. The good news is at least there's no algae on any of these. Oh, that looks like a big step there at the end. <sighs> it looks like there's way around on the side. Yeah. That doesn't look too bad. <laughs> Even got some nice steps in it. One thing I've noticed when we've crossed the contact, we had been walking through granite, which is relatively light in color. We moved into this stuff, which is much darker. It has a strong uh, alignment of all the minerals. That's called a foliation. Um, so this is some sort of a metamorphic rock. It's got sparkly black minerals, which are probably going to be biotite. Um, so, but it's mostly these white minerals. 
And the black will stand out because they're dark, but it's probably still mostly the the quartz and feldspars here. So we'd call this rock a nice, G-N-E-I-S-S. -S. Um, and I don't know with any certainty, but I've been seeing a lot of chunks of this that stream has these big potassium feldspar crystals in it. Um, it looks like a basically a granite diorite knife. Here's a better outcrop of this Algon nice, where you can see these big potassium feldspar crystals and this foliation to it. Um, and when it looks like this, it looks like the classic 1.4 billion year old anorogenic or A type, sometimes they're called, uh, granite diorites you find throughout the southwestern United States. So, an old piece of rock. People argue a little bit about what made the anorogenic granites 1.4 billion years ago. Sometimes when you see these anorogenic granites, they come in after a big plate collision happened uh, by some tens of millions of years. People think maybe they're related to um, the, well, let me just back up. So the crust, the continental crust that the continents are made of, usually has about 40 plus kilometers of crustal material, uh, which is relatively rich in silica. And below that, um, there's an, another rigid part um, called the lithospheric mantle, um, which is made of part of the Earth's mantle, which is more rich in iron and magnesium. The part of that that's cooled down or otherwise chemically enriched such that it's stiffer um, than the underlying convecting mantle. So the main part of the mantle convects and overturns, bringing up heat from the Earth's interior. But the lithospheric mantle doesn't. It just sticks there, um, usually. But occasionally, after perhaps it's been weakened by a, a continent collision, um, this lithosphere may drip off. Uh, and then when that drips off, new hotter, uh, new hotter mantle, a cenosphere we call it, from below it would rise up and cause a melting, uh, leading to potentially the production of grants um, that it would be geochemically similar to these 1.4 billion year old granite. So, uh, to use fancy words, we call that. Uh, delamination of the subcontinental mantle lithosphere, which is a bit of a mouthful, but you know, I am prepared to put on my hat band. I feel it's going to be a gale up there at the top, where the wind is picking up every inch I get closer to the top. Okay, this is the high point of today and the highest point yet on my trip. About 2,900 feet above sea level, or about 890 meters. Um, originally, I was planning to camp somewhere up around here. I think I have enough light to get down this ridge, turn left, to get back down to Corn Spring Wash, uh, where it'll be a little bit warmer and less cold and windy. But I'm going to sit down in the lee of the wind in this little valley here. Uh, I'll just check the time, actually. 232. Oh, that's not bad at all. From the sky, I thought it was going to be like four or something. Well, I'm glad I have time to get back down off this cold, awful mountain. I camp up here, especially without a tent. It'd be real cold. Somewhat less overheating now that I've taken off at least the parka. Still have the sweater on. My wife knit me the sweater. By the way, Specifically for this trip. Well, here's one place I could camp that'd be out of the wind. See, these, uh, this ledge here is just old stream sediments that have been cemented together, probably by calcium carbonate in the groundwater, to form this nice breccia layer. And the stream has carved it underneath it because it's on this bend. Well, 
I don't think I actually want to sleep in a cave, but good to know it's an option in case it starts raining because they don't have my tent. Okay, well, as the sun is starting to set, it's already set where I am. I think I found a nice place to camp. It's got some good wood, nice flat place to lie in my bag, rocks to make a fire circle, someplace without too much vegetation, not in the wash. So, yeah, I think this will be the spot. I'm leaving my campsite again as dawn breaks. Um, eating my sandwich on the go again. This time, not so much because I'm in a hurry, but because it's freaking cold and windy. I mean, I don't think it's actually any colder than it has been, but it's windy. With a nasty wind chill, so. Hmm, there's the sunshine. <laughs> yeah, so we've been walking up through this dye right here, and I was just noticing they're starting to get what well, look a lot like potassium, large potassium feldspar crystals in it, which is not normal to have that much potassium feldspar in a diorite. Um, but then I, we got a, I got a little bit further and I realized that this rock here is that 1.4 billion year old um, A-type granite that famously has large potassium feldspar crystals. So what's happening is this ancient 1.4 billion year old granite is actually being melted and broken apart by the diorite and all the little potassium feldspar crystals are being digested into the diorite. Uh, so you can see so that here's some of the some of the granite diorite and see there's sort of a chunk here um, which is starting to fall apart at the edges and release its release its uh, potassium feldspar crystals uh, into the surrounding diorite. So this is a process called assimilation. This often results in Magma is changing their composition as one magma each another. It would probably be easier to walk down the lower part of the valley, the Corn Spring Canyon Valley, but again, that's not in the wilderness area, so a certain amount of wilderness dodging they need to do. Ah, sunshine. I think the way my day is structured today is I have some sort of rugged patches in the morning and then the evening, but the middle of the day should be pretty fast going I'm down to canyon and across an alluvial plain. And then tonight I'll actually be camping at the very northwestern, well, more or less the northwestern corner of the Chuckawalla Mountains. And then tomorrow I'll be off to Joshua Tree National Park. That looks like a stone cabin. Huh. Those stuff in this rain and side canyon in Port Springs. Wonder if there's an old mine up in this canyon. Not expecting to find this here. Single rock wall. There's a piece of heavy iron something or other here. Not quite sure what that's for. What well, was a piece of? A piece of an old mill, I guess. Yeah, it seems less like a cabin and more like maybe just a couple of rock walls built for shelter out of the wind or something. Because they don't really, you know, they're two, they're two curves, parallels of one another. A random navigational milestone I forgot about, or a kilometer stone I forgot about, is we passed. 200 kilometers a little while ago. Back of the zombie choyas. Brains. Brains. Okay, so we just come down the fan there. And according to the GPS, the end of the wilderness exclusion area is like right there, basically, in the canyon. So even though there appears to be a road continuing, apparently that's not a legal road at this point. Uh, once you get down to the canyon. So now it's just heading down this canyon. For the next few miles. I just have to dodge a few more Choya zombies. Well, and the living ones too. Ah! <laughs> this is not a slope. You want to start an uncontrolled slide down. Yeah, if we get a little closer to these rocks, you'll see they have all these crazy 
black and white folds and swirls in them. These rocks I've seen a lot. There's one up there. I probably can't see it at this zoom level. Let's see if we can find some down lower. But there's, you know, these rocks have been folded up, up a lot. Again, these rocks are, these are these are the the older gneisses um, that are probably meta sedimentary gneisses or para gneisses. Um, and you can see there are these crazy folds that are folded around. If you look in these, you'll find things where there are folds that like go around like this, and then that fold has been folded into its own little taco. So there's, you'll often find multiple episodes of deformation and, and folding and things have been folded and then refolded. Um, but you know, again, these rocks are one point, you know, if these rocks are about 1.7 billion years old, they've seen a lot of earth history. They've probably been in multiple mountain building events. I and mean, every time, you know, like a plate collision happens, uh, they're gonna get messed up. And in 1.7 billion years, they've probably seen a few. There's some other, some more crazy folding up in there. Uh, here's an example of a sheath fold. See here how this fold, it has this little loop uh, in these things. So this was one where the there was some layers and they were pulled out towards us and then it broke off. So you're looking through like if you uh, you like picked up a sheet in the middle and pinched it up and cut it off, you'd get these, these concentric folds like that. Uh, you only get that um, in what we'll call ductile folding. So these, all, the, all the folding in these rocks, we're not about all of it, but the folding we can see in these rocks is folding that occurred when these rocks were deep within the crust, maybe uh, 20, 30 kilometers down or yeah, 15, 20 miles, something like that down if you prefer miles. Uh, at a temperature of, you know, probably 600 degrees or something like that, Celsius, uh, at which the rock becomes relatively taffy-like and it can be pulled and stretched into these crazy folds. Okay, well, wind's picking up, so you're not going to be able to hear me, so I'm just going to keep on going. Magmatite vein in there. See these big flakes here are the mineral biotite. And some of them are in pieces that are, you know, six, eight inches long, you know, or 10, 20 centimeters long if you prefer. And the feldspars and quartz would be the other minerals you'd only find in here, which are the white minerals, they're a little bit less distinctive, but sometimes pegmatites contain more exciting minerals. Um, like tourmalines or gem minerals like beryl, but that's pretty rare. Our pegmatite is just, it's like granite with really big crystals. Some granite countertops uh, are pegmatite. The true granite is basically roughly a third quartz, a third potassium feldspar, a third plagioclase. Usually leaning a little bit more towards the potassium feldspar side. And the pegmatite just means it has big crystals. Where do pegmatites come from? Well, subduction zone magmas often contain a few percent water, but as magma cools and crystallizes, water doesn't fit into many crystals, so the last bit of melt to freeze becomes enriched in water. You may have heard before that crystals grow bigger during slow cooling, but in this case, it's just that the crystallizing ions can diffuse faster through fluid-rich magma. A thin pegmatite actually cools off quite rapidly, perhaps in a matter of hours for a dike of this size. Sure is windy. I have all my layers on right now, so I hope it doesn't get a lot colder than this. Although it's near noon, so... <laughs> hey. And now it's just uh, basically hiking down to the end of this ridge and cutting off sort of the last part there. And then I'll camp on the north side of that ridge. But it's super windy up here on the, on the plains. Yeah, so we're basically at the west end of the... Chuckwald Mountains here, you can see there's an AT&T facility up there. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to cross the road, uh, which will be out of the wilderness for a moment, but originally I'd actually planned to walk around the other side of the mountain, but um, it was going to be rugged stuff like what I did yesterday the whole way, but I didn't think it was feasible, so we're just walking around on the west side. I have to walk with one hand holding on my hat because it's that windy. 
Oh, as it flies off. You can see the Akatios waiting around. Okay, well, I'm uh, finally approaching the AT&T Cherry Stem Road. You can see it with the telephone lines there. Unfortunately, I have this big freaking canyon between me and there. If I had a parachute, I could jump. Actually, you know, it would carry me back up wind. Never mind. Uh, I guess I'll go this way. Maybe I'll get down over here. Okay, so now I briefly leave the wilderness to cross this telephone line. Or at least with a power line, I'm not actually sure. If I don't actually use landlines anymore, I don't know. Uh, but whatever sort of power telephone line and the road up to the AT&T communications facility up there. Yeah, so I'm just up the first hill from the, from the road. Ah, sorry, the wind is trying to destroy me. And already I've come to this giant freaking canyon. What? Just over the hill. Here's another one. Oh, it's easier if the wind breaks. Ah. Buffeting me. My goodness, is not a very long way down. So I do slide, so I'm going to die. It's just going to hurt a little bit. Oh, I'm getting too old for this. Oh, okay. Oh. A little sore for my hat. These canyons, just one after another, is just brutal. It's like having. You know, multiple monster Welsh hedges in a row. They kept, I guess they're sort of like inverted hedges. So I was walking along looking at the end of the Chuckle Mountains here, thinking of nightmare stories, just the standards of which route I was supposed to take. So finally I just stopped and looked at the map. And actually I am taking going to the lowest spot, the gap there, so that doesn't look too bad. I think I can do that. The end is in sight, there's that gap back there is where our path is. I think after that pass, it's going to be a maelstrom of wind. So we'd like to find a nice place to take a little break, have a uh, snack before I push on the final leg, which is then going to be... I think it's only a little over a mile from the gap to where I want to camp, but it's going to be a brutal mile of rocks like I did yesterday. Um, and it's going to be, I think, incredibly windy the entire way. Because that's clean on the side, facing right into the wind. Now we're about to cross over from the west side of the Chuckawallas to the north side of the Chuckawallas. Where we're going to fight our way down to the plain and then camp. Now, unfortunately, it's not going to be quite as straightforward as going straight down to the plain. Uh, because I really want to minimize my wilderness gap between the Chuckawalla Wilderness and the Joshua Tree Wilderness. And the, um, the shortest path between those two is a little bit east of here. So I'm actually going to double back a little bit east. Uh, and unfortunately the wilderness boundary starts above the top of the plain. So I can't just walk down to the plain first and then double back because then that would defeat the whole purpose. Um, so I have to actually Go over the pass and then head a couple ridges to the right. Uh, if I really want to minimize my out of wilderness experience. So. I will try that if possible. But it should only be a mile still to camp even with that. So it's just going to be a rugged mile. You can already hear the wind. As we approach the pass here. Windy. I'm not sure it's any worse than the plane. Well, okay, it's a little worse. It's slightly treacherous. 
Okay, so I think I want to basically head over that gap there, or one of those gaps, and then get to that next ridge, and then go down that one. So, yeah, I think I need to go down this back to the right of that nasty looking notch there. Well, I can hardly walk forward, the wind is so strong. I can have my hat stop choking me. Okay, on for the final assault. Uh, when I got here, I sat down to take off my sweaters, change the GoPro battery, SD card, put the thing in the mountain. Now the sun has already escaped up to there. I can get catch up to it soon. But I just scrambly took off the sweaters because one, this side of the mountain is actually not quite as windy. Well, now I say that, of course, the wind has picked up. And two, I know that I'm going to be doing lots of cardio here getting up these boulders, so. Okay, back up to the sun. So far, none of this is technical, at least. And all the boulders are big enough that they're not loose. I like climbing on big boulders for that reason. The only problem, of course, is if one is loose, then you'll it'll trap your limb and you'll have to cut it off with your knife in order to survive. Actually, you don't have to do that because I have a satellite messaging, messaging system with me. So I can just call someone to give them my location and have them rescue me with the Garmin inReach. This will be my last climb of the day. The rest of the day will just be getting down the ridge, I think. This is good because the sun is not that high in the sky anymore. And I'm starting to feel a little rumbly in my tumbly, as Pooh Bear would say. Okay, jackets are on. Took a quick break to check the map. Sorry, GoPro. Good thing is, I hear GoPros are really indestructible. Oops, no. Do not attempt to unzip jacket without taking care of GoPro first. Goodbye, son. Well, so I got about 20 probably minutes of good light and 20 minutes of well, the wind is excellent. The precipice is really trying to blow you off the edge. When it's not blowing across the edge, you're leaning into it as you're going down the hill. And then if it suddenly cuts out. Okay. 
Look at that here, up close. It's that time of the day where the temperature dropped rapidly. It was pretty windy, at least it was. I don't know, sometimes wind drops off after the sun sets. So I sort of paddled myself a bit. You're just talking to your students. Yeah. And I suppose the general public. Flags them down. This is an emergency. I need a taco. Okay, so somewhere around here, very close to here, probably within 10 meters, if not 10 or 10 or tens of meters, is the closest corner of the Chuckawalla Mountains Wilderness to Joshua Tree National Park Wilderness, which is just across the way there. Which is of course why I'm coming down this ridge in the first place, is to minimize that non-wilderness distance. So I'm not but somewhere within tens of meters of here, I leave that wilderness area. So I won't be camping in the wilderness tonight. I think I might camp in that little canyon down there on the left. It looks like that might be a little bit out of the way. Now I'm thinking about tacos. Oh, for a nice El Pastor right now. 